Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Schwab. I'm a producer at Restaurant Spaces, and this is Disrupt. In fact, it is episode two of Disrupt. Uh, and uh, what even is Disrupt? Well, Disrupt is a chance for you to tune in here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, and maybe you can expose yourself to some ideas, uh, some way of doing things that might walk you might walk away from and think, I never saw the world that way before. Uh, and how are we going to do that? Well, I hop on to LinkedIn every now and then, and I try and find a big thinker, someone who might be doing things a little differently or doing things ex uh, in an exciting way in the restaurant industry. And I pester them with enough emails until they want to agree to come onto the show just to shut me up. And then we have a little conversation with them. Uh, 20 minutes, just enough time, maybe while you're wolfing down some lunch or something like that. And we're going to see what they're up to. We are going to see how they're thinking about the future of the restaurant industry and our guest today is someone who I am very excited to introduce you to. Her name is Melissa Ng, and she is the SVP of Design and Construction at Carver. Carver, of course, are brand doing really, really cool things. And Melissa is no stranger to restaurant spaces. Uh, she's been to our event before in the past, a live event. And uh, she uh, has also participated in some of our uh round tables that we've been running digitally uh end of last year and that's how she kind of ended up on my radar um she, uh, she has been in the industry now for over a decade she has uh she started out in retail first at uh, victoria's secrets pink and then some time at td bank she then spent about six and a half years at chipotle as the head of the innovation center there before going back into retail at blink fitness and as of last year She's been with Carver, a new role for her, and uh, Carver's doing some really crazy, wonderful, exciting things, and they're expanding really rapidly. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But enough from me. Let us bring Melissa on live right now on to Disrupt. Hello, Melissa. Welcome to Disrupt. How are you going today? I'm very good. Hi, Jason. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Where, where, where are you calling in from today? I am currently in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm based. Right. How's, how's New York looking at this stage in the, in the pandemic? Uh, it's, it's looking busier and busier as things are opening up, but it's a beautiful sunny day here. So can't wait to get back into some restaurants and, and start in restaurant dining. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to the rejuvenation of that city and everywhere else, right? Now, um, Melissa, I do want to jump straight into it. Uh, I think most of our audience, you know, they design and build restaurants, are pretty familiar with Carver, but uh, I'm going to give you uh, exactly 42 seconds. Um, if you can just explain the concept Carver and, and where you are right now. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think it's really important to talk about uh, Kava's origin story because our ethos and what it was in 2006 definitely still drives the decisions that we make for the brand today. Um, so, you know, Ted and Ike, uh, two of our founders, always grew up in the restaurant industry. Dimitri is a trained chef. And uh, back in 2006, they had the idea to really celebrate and bring to a much wider audience a more authentic food from their heritage, recipes from their families, um, you know, and how to bring those, that, those recipes to guests. Um, and they wanted to do it in a way that really upheld the credibility or their credibility as um, an authentic Mediterranean offering. So, you know, they started off with a few uh, full service sit down restaurants and they still independently own and operate those today. Um, a few years later, they got into the CPG business and we have our product in over 450 Whole Foods. Uh, fast forward to 2011 and Cava Grill, as we know it today as a fast casual brand was born and our first location opened in Bethesda. Um, 
you know, even though Kava Grill today is a very different, you know, fast casual model, um, we still say we serve it fast, but the food is meant to be enjoyed slow. How do I do go. on time? No, I think I think you were right, spot on. I, I don't know why I decided to just give you forty two seconds. It just seemed a good good idea at the time. But th thanks for giving us the the, the general rundown there, Melissa. Um, it's it's just a really exciting time for Carver at the moment, right? Uh, you know, you had the acquisition of Zoe's Kitchens, another chain, uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, started out with two hundred fifty locations of those, uh, and you're now converting those into actual Carver locations. Uh, which you know is a, a really rapid way of getting to market-wide share of, of Carver there. Um, and just a few weeks ago, it was announced you guys got an extra hundred and ninety million dollars of funding. So, what's what's that going to go towards moving forward? Yeah. So, as you mentioned, in in twenty eighteen, um, we acquired the Zoe's brand, and they at the time had I think over two hundred fifty restaurants, and Kava only had about seventy or maybe less than seventy. Um, so the $190 million in funding is really going to help us um, accelerate and execute on that conversion strategy where we'll take the majority of our, our Zoe's restaurants and convert them over to the Kava brand. You know, in addition, um, we want to be or are currently valued at over a billion dollars. And so from an infrastructural standpoint, there's a lot that we need to invest in to really become a $1 billion um, company. Um, so that's that's where some of that money will go. And then in addition, um, we'll be uh, able to accelerate investment in some of the digital platforms and enhancement of our current digital um, capabilities uh, with with that uh, funding. Okay, yeah, super exciting stuff. and and. I guess the, the, with the conversion, so, uh, you know, you, st you started out with 250 restaurants, Zoe's restaurants there, which you're converting. Uh, and I think you've got about 170, 180 right now. Um, yep. Yeah, we have, can you talk I us think through today, what the, 175 Zoe's. Right. Okay. Uh, just there, just in 175. So uh, can you talk us through the process then of converting these locations? What's, what's the timeline like per location and uh, the, the cost? And I guess what's the schedule like moving forward for the next few years, uh, converting them all? Yep, so by the end of this year, we'll convert um, over 50 restaurants uh, from Zoe's to Cava. And you know, prior to this year, we had converted just eight. We've uh, converted another eight in the first half of, of, of the year. Um, and the cost and time of uh, converting a Zoe's over to a Cava it's about uh, less than half the time um, in active construction and about half the cost. So um, clearly this uh, you know, portfolio of real estate that we purchased or acquired with Zoe's is really allowing us to accelerate our growth um, in terms of our actual restaurant portfolio. Um, in terms of our build out time, we allow for about five and a half weeks from groundbreak um, to construction completion. You know, a normal restaurant will take us, uh, a, a new restaurant could take us anywhere from 14 to 16 weeks, uh, depending on scope. Um, so clearly we're able to open a lot more restaurants um, much faster with our conversions. Um, and I would say, you know, they come in at about half the cost because the scope of work is is much lower. We do anywhere from, you know, I'd say 25 to 40 percent of work in the back of house. Um, luckily, we're able to reuse a lot of the current kitchen infrastructure. We reuse the existing hood. Some of the equipment is reused. Um, you know, of course, we change out our whole serve line because Zoe's is more of like a order at the counter and get your food when it's prepared as opposed to uh, what Kava Grill is, which is the assemble, um, you know, to your liking as you walk down the uh, walk down the line. Right. Okay. Quite, quite involved there. And, and I... I guess with this conversion that you're doing in at these locations, uh, I guess I want to speak about some any challenges you might be having with that. Uh, specifically, you know, everything's so liquid these days. Every industry has to move a lot quicker than it used to, and that's especially true with restaurants. Uh, you know, we you've got to be able to pivot really quickly for the change that's happening six months, a year from now, with the the digital revolution that's happening in restaurants. So. Uh, when you're converting these, what kind of considerations are you putting into place to keep flexibility at the forefront of your mind when you do it? Yep. 
I would say that anyone in restaurant design and construction who has ever tried to do a remodel project or a conversion project will, you know, we know that those types of projects are more, while they can happen quicker and be executed faster, they take a different type of collaboration up front and they're almost, uh, well, I won't say almost, they are more difficult to execute. Um, both from the planning side as well as the construction side um, than a new restaurant. Um, I think most of us would say we'd rather do new restaurants than than a conversion project. Um, you know, and that is without all of the challenges that we're facing because of the pandemic that, you know, we're still in or, or coming out of. Um, you know, with rising construction costs, um, with material shortages, with shipping delays, with the same type of labor impact that we're seeing on the subcontractor side, as we're seeing, you know, on the restaurant employee side, there's all sorts of challenges that we're facing right now that, you know, for companies um, like Kava, who luckily are kind of in that sweet spot of scale, you know, we're just big enough that we have leverage, um, but we're not too big where we're a slow moving dinosaur. Uh, the key is really to be nimble and to be able to be flexible and, you know, be a little paranoid and try to run as many scenarios, uh, what if scenarios as you can in your head um, and, and be able to kind of, uh, you know, move with the tide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Definitely the attitude that everybody needs to have at the moment. I mean, if we could just bring up a few images of the, you've given us a few images of the conversions there. Um, Laura, if you just want to bring a few of those up, um, maybe you can talk through uh, a few of them, a few of the design elements that, uh, that uh, stick out to you here or anything you want to talk through as we, we show some of these. Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, I mentioned um, we can convert a Kava or a Zoe's to a Kava in half, less than half the time and half the cost. But what's really important for us from the guest perspective is the a converted Kava should look and feel and the experience should be equitable to a new Kava that they might have visited before. So we really, um, with with a smaller uh, you know, development investment cost, really want that the converted restaurants to feel um, just the same as, as a new Kava. And, and these are two examples of, of where we've done it. Okay, perfect. Uh, I do want to shift gears here, uh, but before I do, um, I just want to say to anyone who might be watching, uh, throw some questions in the comments there. We might have some time to throw them at Melissa before we wrap up today. But, uh, you know, since Carver's inception, Melissa, uh, you guys have been really tech forward. Um, I, I remember a few years ago that you had a chief data scientist uh, that I was trying to track down and get to speak at restaurant spaces. And, uh, you know, especially when it comes to uh, gathering data at your locations and, uh, using Internet of Things technology uh, it was really kind of forward thinking, and and I guess I want to see you know fast forward to a couple of years to now and what Carver's vision is for this kind of tech and using locations as uh, you know for gathering data uh, of customers and how that's then going to affect design. Yep, I would say that um, Kava has always been really good at looking at our own data, synthesizing it, and making decisions that you know obviously not only benefit our business but create a better experience for our guests. So a really good example of how we did that um, in the past was, you know, we started looking at some of our sales data, you know, even pre-pandemic, um, and noticed that the average check quantity was going up, right? So people were ordering multiple meals on one check. And what we decided to do, and you know, we were, we're a very nimble organization, as I mentioned, we were able to implement something called the family meal very quickly, both um, you know, from an operations perspective, as well as um, in our app itself, in terms of the, uh, the ability to order a family meal in the app. Um, and so we launched it and they are um, meals that can serve, you know, six to 10 people. Uh, you order uh, digitally, you pick it up in the restaurant and then you take it home and have, have a meal with uh, friends or family. And that's one example of how we use data um, and our team of data scientists. Scientists will synthesize that data to not just implement tech for tech's sake, which happens a lot, um, but really implements, uh, you know, in this case, an offering that was something that our guests were almost subconsciously telling us that they wanted and something that's been really successful for us. Perfect. Okay. And I guess moving forward, are there any kind of, uh, what's the kind of tech that goes in to gather this data? Is it mostly sensors or is there any plans for 
uh, future kind of tech that you're rolling out here. And um, I know you're also playing around, I'm just throwing a million things at you right now, uh, also with digital menu boards that change on a more regular basis than what you would have seasonally. Yep, all of it. Um, so we're looking at a number of different technologies. And as I mentioned, this latest round of funding is really going to help us accelerate a lot of that. You know, we're, we're like many other brands looking at digital menu boards. But the thing that we're really cautious about is, um, you know, not just throwing digital menu boards into all of our restaurants, but really doing um, a very deep dive before we embark on the initiative to understand how we want the digital menu boards to one, not just, as I mentioned, enhance the guest experience, but is there data that we can, um, you know, cull from the use of dynamic content that will help inform what we should do, you know, not just today, but, but tomorrow. Um, we're also looking into, you know, whether we should be using technology tied to, um, you know, heat mapping um, in our restaurants. Um, it will not only help inform kind of traffic studies, but also when we um, start our new restaurant uh, prototype design later this year, it'll help us identify, um, you know, bottlenecks or pain points um, in the guest journey as they move throughout the space. Well, wow, okay, perfect. Really, really exciting stuff. It, um, is it, with with that kind of stuff? Is there are there any concerns about how the guests might feel about that kind of technology being included, or is it it's not that intrusive, right? Yeah, and and that's always been our approach when we implement technology, whether it's an enhancement to the app, whether it's a new offering, um, you know, a digital ordering offering um, that we implement. We always try to um, make the technology as, um, I would say, invisible as possible um, because we still take um, a lot of pride in the fact that our brand is, is based on, you know, a really great feeling of hospitality, making our guests feel at, like they're welcome and served and not just, um, as I mentioned before, you know, throwing technology into a restaurant for technology's sake, just because it's the, the latest or, or coolest thing. So anything that we do in the restaurant should really be invisible to the guest, or if it is visible, it should enhance their, their experience within the restaurant. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for running us through some of that there, Melissa. And uh, look, I just want to cut, uh, you know, these aren't very long conversations and I want to cut to some audience questions that we have coming in at the moment. Uh, we have a few. Um, we've got someone, one from uh, JP uh, from Oxblue, uh, and he asks, uh, does Carver consider themselves, uh, sorry, does the Zoe's Carver um, location stay open during the conversion? Yeah, great, great question, because I know a lot of brands, um, both on you know the restaurant side or, or the retail side, will try to stay open um, so as not to you know obviously lose revenue during during a remodel. We uh, make this decision to close our restaurants for that entire time. And, you know, we're getting our kind of choreography of last day of Zoe sales to grand opening and everything that needs to happen within that time period down to a science. Um, and, you know, if we were to stay open during a remodel, the remodel would just take much longer and, and could, could potentially um, have a more negative impact to overall revenue loss. So, you know, it's, it's more efficient for us in terms of the speed that we need to execute these conversions to completely shut down the restaurant. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here from James Damien, who is the uh, former chairman of Buffalo Wild Wings uh, and also the former head of design for Best Buy. And he asks, you know, what, what role does culture and design thinking play in your approach to the employee and guest experience? Oh, I love that question. It's a good one. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk it's... about, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, employee experience now and how culture plays into that. And then uh, future thinking guest experience. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the guest experience piece first. Um, you know, one thing that we're working on now is um, kind of a, a rebrand. Um, and, you know, our brand creative marketing team is leading that. And we will um, embark on a new restaurant prototype journey, um, I'll call it, later this year. One of the things, um, both on, you know, kind of thinking about what the future of, of our brand is and then how that translates into the restaurant design. We're really trying to create a more authentic atmosphere in our restaurants. You know, when we um, gathered some feedback on guest perception um, of our restaurants today, I would say that the majority of people polled said the restaurant feels clean and modern, um, which, you know, 
isn't bad. I think our restaurants are beautiful today, but they don't quite speak to um, an authentic culture um, like our food does in, in as strong a way as it could. So that's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on with our new restaurant prototype. Um, you know, in terms of employee experience, um, I would say, you know, and a lot of people say this about the brands that they work for, but I, I definitely think in, in Kava's case, it is true. Um, and it has a, as, has a lot to do with the fact that our founders are still very much involved in our business. Our company really still does have a kind of family atmosphere, um, not just uh, in the in-store employee um, from their experience, but you know, even in our corporate support center. Um, so that idea of hospitality, of togetherness, you know, it's not just in our food, but it, um, you know, it really uh, continues through our brand and our and our internal culture as well. Perfect. Thank you. That's, that was quite an in-depth answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we have I have a couple more coming in. Um, just going back to technology here from uh, Stuart Henderson, how do you evaluate the investment uh, of technology has been successful when you put it into a store? Yep. Um, hi, Stuart. I, I used to work with Stuart previously. Um, you know, sometimes it's it's difficult because, uh, you know, the expense of technology can be, be very high and the direct uh, correlation to a return on investment can be very difficult to measure. And I would say that our approach to kind of measuring those ROIs has not been necessarily black and white. And I think that's what's helped us in the past. Um, in addition, you know, I think our technology investments um, have been probably compar compared to other organizations lower because we have a robust in-house technology team. Um, so that helps us control costs in that way. But I would say when we're looking at ROI, we're not just looking at the dollar spent on technology and seeing a direct correlation to sales. We really take a more holistic approach um, to evaluating the impact because some of those impacts are more indirect, right? Like the improvement in, for example, our app, it resulted in one higher sales, but also a much more seamless and better experience for our guests. So those types of um, indirect relationship to, you know, the ROI are, are things that we look at as well. And, you know, looking at things that way allows um, cost to not always be a roadblock to um, piloting a great idea. Um, and sometimes in larger organizations, that is um, kind of an obstacle or a threshold to, you know, just testing something out in a limited way. Yeah, that uh, that being being that ability to be nimble is something you've really got happening on your side right now. Which brings me to another audience question uh, from Tim Scroger, who's from QSI Enterprise, uh, which is about an, another organization which is much bigger. Uh, the question is: uh, Does Carver consider themselves similar or different than Chipotle? Um, uh, is a similar restaurant model, and and why? Um, I get this question a lot, or a lot of times when people ask me what Kava is, I say it's the Chipotle of the Mediterranean world. Um, you know, and, and as uh, Jason mentioned previously, I spent um, several years at Chipotle, and I think a lot of us in the restaurant industry that you know work for organizations that are much smaller in scale than Chipotle, a lot of us aspire to be the Chipotle of something. I would say, um, you know, aspiring to be Chipotle is a great thing, but our offering, of course, is is very different. Um, and and we learn a lot from uh, many people um, in the fast casual landscape. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say from a scale perspective that we're quite at Chipotle level yet. Obviously, we're 113 restaurants strong, and I would hope to have you know thousands of restaurants one day. Um, you know, I, I would say we're um, friends, not competitors necessarily, but, you know, I, I think a lot of people aspire to be the Chipotle of, of something one day. There you go. I, I wonder if Chipotle feels the same Chipotle. Are you friends with Carver? Um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's also a slogan in itself. Everyone wants to be the, the Chipotle of something one day. Um, and look, we, we are running out of time. In fact, we're over time, but I do want to ask one question that's from the audience uh, as well. Uh, just one last one, and that's about the customer reaction to these remodels. What, what's it been like when you trans when you transform it into a, a Kava? How do you manage to convert that customer to to being a Kava uh, evangelist? Yep. Yeah, you know, I think um, 
Zoe's uh, Zoe's Mediterranean Kitchen had a very, uh, or I won't say a very, but a, sim a similar offering. Um, and if our sales, uh, pre-conversion and post-conversion sales are any indication of the adoption of the Kava brand once we convert, then I'd say we're doing, we're doing really, really well. Um, our marketing team and operations team also does a phenomenal job with community days prior to any new restaurant opening. Um, and I think that, you know, that goes, goes a long way as well, but you know, I'll use sales as an indicator of how happy our guests are with, with uh, the conversions. And I'd say they're very happy. Perfect. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, just really, really quickly, you know, obviously we're heading, the light is at the end of the tunnel with the pandemic and, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of figuring out about what's next and a lot of talk about maybe we're just returning to what's happening before. Um, what's your take on what's happening and what we're, in a, what we're emerging into next? And what's maybe something that you see happening in the restaurant industry that maybe people should be paying more attention to or, or doing a bit differently? Yeah, you know, I think, um, and Kava is no exception, many brands saw a huge spike in digital sales during the pandemic. Um, some of us are starting to level out, but still at higher, higher than uh, pre-pandemic levels of, of digital sales. I would say that if people eating in plastic bubbles on the sidewalks of New York during the height of winter, during the pandemic, if that is any indication of people wanting to gather to eat and be in restaurants, I would say that, you know, we, even though we're putting a lot of stock into, you know, digital platforms, I think we can't forget about that in restaurant hospitality. Absolutely. And he's hoping to uh, us not being in bubbles on the sidewalk anymore and back in restaurants and back to some kind of semblance of normal uh, into the future. Melissa Ng, thank you so much for joining us on Disrupt. You've been really great and eloquent. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, there you go, everybody. That is episode two of Disrupt. Thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to Melissa at Carver for joining us today as well. And uh, I want to tell you who our next guest is for next Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern, happening every week here on LinkedIn Live. But before I do, I just want to give you a very, very, very quick, shameless plug about restaurant spaces. Now, this is Disrupt, produced by Restaurant Spaces. Before the world kind of caved in on itself last year, we produced live events, uh, a retreat, very intimate, very small. The top leaders in restaurant design, development, and construction brought them together in a nice location, no more than 150 to 200 people. and we haven't been able to do that for a long while. So come October, October 17th to 19th to be exact, we're going to be back in person, in the flesh, in Palm Springs. And uh, we're going to put a link up in the chat just now. So if you want an invite to that, want to meet with the in the flesh, then um, I don't know why. Palm Springs come October. But uh, hey, enough from me. Thank you so much for joining us on Disrupt Episode 2. Next week, we are going to be speaking to a person called Benjamin Calleja. Ben, I'm really sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. I'll work on it before next week. Ben is the CEO and founder of Livit, which is a design and consultancy firm, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, he's been at restaurant spaces before speaking. Uh, he's a really electric, really switched on, really in intelligent guy. And every time we put his talks up on YouTube, our uh, views go through the roof more than anything that we can put up. So um, I'm going to uh, put up a link to that. Uh, you can sign up to that uh, for next week. Make sure you join us then uh, Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern. And otherwise, enjoy the rest of your weeks. Enjoy your weekends. We'll see you next Thursday. See you later. I'm going to need you to back up. I'm going to need you to back up. Yep. I'm going to need you to back up. Spilling the tea. You stirring the...